A client texted me Saturday morning this past week and said, hey, look at this. They had a nice plaque that had their revenue from year one. It was over 1.2 million in year one. Hey, hey, what is up? My favorite people in the podcast world, that is, of course, MU Nation. I'm Brian Guerin, back with you with another episode today on the Millionaire University podcast. And we are featuring John Austinson of Frambridge Consulting. He specializes in non-food franchise opportunities. And let me tell you what, this is something I've been adjacent to before. I've seen franchising. I know a little bit about it, but especially when it comes to the non-food opportunities, I'm probably like a lot of people where I thought it's really just food. No, there's franchise opportunities abounding everywhere. So John is joining us today. To tell us all about these opportunities and why they resonate with so many people. Let's jump right in and chat with John Austinson of Frambridge Consulting. Here we go. I was in the corporate world for a number of years, consulting, and then worked for a Fortune 1000 business. And they were really good to me. Got my MBA during that time, but had that itch to do something a little more entrepreneurial and just wasn't sure what it was. And so about seven, eight years ago, I went from a public company to a private company. And that private company happened to be Shelf Genie Franchise Systems. And so I worked on the franchisor side there at the corporate headquarters supporting our franchise owners all across North America. I served as president of the company. We grew it really fast. For me, that was when I had the light bulb moment of, hey, this franchise model is working for so many people with different backgrounds. I really fell in love with it. And so long story short, I ended up partnering with a founder. We spun off. We invested in franchises ourselves as franchisees. So I've been on both sides of the table. And you know, today I still own a good number of franchises with other partners in some cases. But I'm fairly hands-off and it allows me to spend most of my time helping others do the same. So I work with entrepreneurs and investors all across the country. We've never seen so much interest as we're seeing right now. I think for a variety of reasons, whether it be cash on the sidelines, whether it be everybody wants to be their own boss, especially coming out of COVID, they want to build their own empire instead of someone else's. And then also a lot of real estate investors are moving our direction too, just as another tax advantage alternative investment. So my job is to, to plug people in and uh, show them what I see as best in class available in their area, which I'll dig more into. Okay. Yeah. Well, by all means, let's dig into that because for me, the first question that comes to mind is non-food franchises. So is this specific to like retail? What all types of businesses are you talking about here? When I say the F word franchise, most people think fast food, right? So mm -hmm. the title of my book, which I'm happy to give a free copy to all of your listeners, uh, you know, will be in the show notes, I'm sure. The title is non-food franchising. And so it's really educating people and all these other opportunities outside of food. And you know, we need the food guys, we support them, but my humble belief is for a variety of reasons, there are easier ways to make money. And so the industries that we're focused on are things like home and property services, you know, kind of the non-sexy, everything from insulation to gutters, to floor coatings, to dumpsters, to things like health and wellness, everything from men's testosterone clinics to mental health, businesses that cater to areas like kids, pets, seniors, Things that people will spend on, regardless of the economy, I'd say is the overall theme that we're seeing right now. These understandable businesses, they're not going to be disrupted by Amazon or AI anytime soon, right? And they're kind of more needs-based. And so we work with over 600 different franchise companies, really all of those that are in growth mode, and probably 95% of those are outside of the food industry. Can you kind of walk us through the process of how maybe I'm similar in position where I'm, I'm ready to start franchising. I don't know in what, but I, I reach out to John and I say, John... I want to get involved in franchising, but I don't know how. I may imagine you probably want to make sure that the person is ready, willing, and able to jump into it and handle it properly. But how do you decide what industry or how, how does that work? Yeah. You know, first off, I'll say it's entirely free to work with us. I'm essentially a real estate agent, but for franchises. And so we get a referral fee on the back end from the brand when a placement happens. None of that gets passed on to our clients at all. So it's a nice, clean model. But no, I take clients through a very streamlined process in which we'll have an introduction call. I kind of know where to take that conversation and the questions to ask. I have them fill out an online profile that takes probably two or three minutes. And then I come back to them a couple of days later with the opportunities. Typically, we're looking at somewhere around 10 or 12 opportunities. If I'm in your shoes, based on what you shared with me, based on what I'm seeing in the market, and I have been fortunate, I do more placements than anybody in the country. So I get to see firsthand what's resonating with different backgrounds. So bringing that in and then oftentimes our constraint is what's available in your market. So once we put those filters in and we've already done the filtering as far as who's got the best leadership teams and the competitive advantages and the financial models, all those sift down to, you know, 10 or 12 that we will review together in your market. 
Your goal then would be to narrow that down to maybe three or four to actually have a conversation with. We can always bring others back in, but that gives us a really good starting point. Oftentimes, it's that one that was number three in your mind going into the conversations. You have that light bulb moment. You look at your spouse and say, that's the right one. But the franchisors will take you through a series of calls and presentations over a period of time. You know, we're there on the sideline to kind of hold your hand through the process and we can bring in funding resources or have a franchise attorney review the agreement. So kind of a one-stop shop to get you set up with the right opportunity. Okay. That sounds awesome. One question I have, let's say you get set up, John sets you up, you do a great job setting people up and you get them in place. Now, how do you start building an empire? Or you had mentioned that it can work towards maybe semi-passive or working fewer hours and not stressing as much while still running these franchises. Do you have a few examples of how people that you've placed can be successful in these various types of businesses? Absolutely. Roughly half of our clients are looking to be what we call owner operators from day one. That's where maybe they're leaving their corporate job or whatever they were doing previously and they jump in and they're running the business. The other half from day one are looking to be semi-passive. Now, I will say a lot of those owner operators eventually have the goal of becoming semi-passive, but you know, semi-passive means you're investing in having a manager run the day-to-day -day business. I mean, the buck still stops with you as the owner, but because you've got a good franchisor on the sidelines, they can provide a lot of that daily support, you know, carrying the water for you, helping that manager progress. So that's a beautiful thing about franchising is that it can be run semi-passive. I never want to sugarcoat it. It's still a lot of work, but a lot of our clients do go that path from day one. We just have example after example. A lot of our clients come back and buy additional brands in the future. Maybe they buy additional territories. I actually call it franchise stacking. You know, some of our clients will have you know, multiple franchises to either diversify from each other or maybe they complement each other in some ways. But a lot of them invest in real estate as well. And they just see franchising and really business ownership as a tax advantage piece of their investment portfolio in which they have a little more control. And the beautiful thing is not only are you building cash flow, but you're getting the tax benefits. You're also building an asset that you're going to be able to sell down the road. Right, right. So when you get into these franchise opportunities, is it a matter of starting with one and then growing from there? Or are there opportunities where you end up buying three or four at a time? How does that work? I'd say probably two thirds of our clients will actually buy multiple locations out of the gate uh, with a given brand. And it's not that they're opening them all day one. And a lot of these businesses don't even require a physical location. They may be more remote, like let's say in-home health or some of those property services I mentioned. So they might buy three territories you know, they start their marketing efforts the first six months in one of them. And then maybe six months, nine months later, they start marketing in territory number two. It gives them a path to scale. Another common thing will be franchisees buying out other franchisees. It gives one an exit. It gives the other a chance to expand. So that's very common. That's something I've personally done as we bought adjacent franchisees to us in the past uh, with some of my businesses. I'd say most people don't start with two brands, like two different businesses out of the gate, but you will see people come back and buy that second one oftentimes you know, six months later, 12 months later, that sort of thing. Do you have to have a real passion for the type of business that the specific franchise will do? Or is it really, it doesn't matter like health and wellness, are gyms an option for franchising in this type Absolutely. of scenario? Let's say the, the franchise owner, I have, luckily I do go to the gym and I, I try to keep myself in shape, but let's say I had zero interest in gyms. Does that matter at all? Will that affect their ability to grow and, and operate and nurture the franchise or what does that look like? I'd say yes and no. It depends on the individual. Probably two thirds of my clients will say, hey, we're industry agnostic. We're open minded. Show us what cash flows. It requires the fewest number of employees and all those types of characteristics. But then about a third of my clients will say, hey, we really want to stick with something that we can kind of get our arms around day one based on our background. Now, I'd say the most important thing is transferable skill sets not transferable industry knowledge. That's where the franchise work comes in. I've got doctors that have bought insulation companies. I've got attorneys that have bought gyms before. The things that they weren't trained on, we just had. But then we also have doctors that have bought in-home health care or similar type of setup. We had a real estate broker the other day that bought a property management business. Well, that's a directly correlating to his core business, right? If you really see it across the board, but I'd say the fun thing is more than 90% of my clients end up purchasing something that, that was never on their radar. We've had a lot of clients getting involved in like youth soccer. <laughs> Most hmm. didn't come to me looking for that, but they said, whoa, we really like the characteristics and the people behind the business. And we see the opportunity to give back to the community and make some good money. So it's fun. 
Wow. Those are things you wouldn't think of franchising, right? One thing that comes to mind is you see signs all around town for kids' sports camps. I imagine there's probably a handful of franchises involved in that, right? Like just running camps from city to city. Absolutely. And as a former athlete doing all those types of camps, I, I'm sure that is a very lucrative business. Yeah. You know, you may have to deal with parents, but you know, every business has something they have to deal with, right? Yeah. But the trade-offs, I mean, <laughs> there, there is such demand and people will always spend on their kids. So no, we've got some great options in that arena. As an entrepreneur who started my own business, I, I haven't been involved in franchising, but I'm really curious to know the comparison between diving into franchising versus doing your own startup in whatever field it may be. What are the advantages or disadvantages of heading into franchising versus starting up your own gig? Yeah, you know, part of it depends on how you look at it. I'd say some existing business owners come to us and they say, hey, we'd love to start a franchise. In some cases, I have to tell them, you're too entrepreneurial. You want to put your thumbprints all over the business, and, and that's just not what a franchise is. In other cases, they say, hey, I've been there, done that. I know how much work it takes. I'd much rather start on third base, you know, to be cliche versus you know having to start from ground zero. The way I think about the benefits, I mean, there, there are some tangible and intangible benefits. Tangible would be, you know, maybe there's some brand awareness already. You know, in some cases, maybe less important. Like I mentioned, the insulation industry, $50 billion industry. Most people can't name a brand in there. So instead, it's all the other things that matter. It's the support team on the sidelines and their track record of supporting successful franchisees. So you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. It's a supply chain, whether it be for services or products, you know, that you're buying in bulk. So you're able to get better pricing. It's the fact that your marketing can be close to optimized in a lot of cases from day one, because this franchise has already launched other owners in other markets. They know what works and what doesn't and the best use of your marketing spend on the business. A lot of best practices are shared across franchisees. And so you have others running the same thing, exchanging ideas and practices. The better you do, the better a franchise award does. So you've got that coach on the sidelines. It's a business in a box at the end of the day. And one of the things that oftentimes gets overlooked is when you go to sell the business, Franchises, research has shown, actually traded a higher multiple in a given industry than non-franchise businesses in that same industry. So there are a lot of wins in there. The downside, again, is you're not going to be able to totally run the business off the rails in your creative direction. However, a good franchisor is going to give you some creative liberty to try new things and, and test them out. I'm really curious to know, and I'm sure this varies per industry and per franchise, but what is it? take to get into the franchise game? What are the startup costs in this case for getting into franchise? I know you have to buy into it. And then what is the earning potentials? How does the franchise owner end up delineating their pay from the business as is, or if it's new, if it's old, how does that all shape out? In most cases, I'd say probably 75% of our clients are getting involved in things where they're all in investment it's between maybe 150,000 and 300,000. You know, just a lot of opportunities that fall within that range. And what that consists of would be a franchise fee typically of around 50000 or so that you pay at the beginning to reserve the license and the rights to that area. Then some working capital, maybe call it three or six months of working capital, you know, some upfront costs to start the business. So that's what they would build into that range. We call it the item seven within their FDD, the franchise disclosure document. Ongoing wise, typically that franchisee is paying somewhere around 6% of revenue, maybe 1% for the royalty to the franchise or maybe 1% of revenue for the marketing fund. The question you want to ask going in is what do I get for that, right? Are these expenses that I would be paying anyway, you know, if I was just running the business solo on my own? You know, what kind of support am I getting from that franchise or? So you really want to make sure you get your arms around that. But the way we look at financials and what our clients are getting, you know, from a margin and return standpoint, nets out the royalty, you know, we take that into consideration. So end of the day, the franchisor, like I said, it, the better the franchisee does, the franchisors, they do better. Rising tide raises all ships. And mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the reason private equity absolutely loves franchising. And they'll come in at times and buy at the franchisee level, but primarily it's at the franchisor level that they'll come in and put strategic capital behind them. And I'd say nine times out of 10, I've seen that be a good thing. There's just some really strong groups out there right now that are involved in franchising and they love the model for multiple reasons. PEs coming in and they're buying up franchise locations or multiple franchises, and they're using their startup capital to build these franchises to start obviously getting that ROI on their investment. Is That's a big part of the franchise game right now, too? Yeah, I'd say in some cases they come in and buy a large swath of franchisees, open territories or existing ones, you know, which provides people an opportunity to exit. I'd say in more cases, though, they're investing at the franchisor level. And what they may do is buy a concrete company here and a painting company here, and they build this portfolio, let's say, of home services. 
Well, all of a sudden they've got this power over marketing vendors where they get some synergies there. They've got a home office team that can support multiple brands. The sum is greater than the parts. Oftentimes is kind of the thinking behind that. Very, very common today. But you know, at times they'll come in at the franchisee level. I mean, look at Orange Theory, look at Pods, businesses where they invested at the franchisor level, but actually bought up franchisees and took them corporate. When you're buying up a franchise, let's say it's just one location, but it's going to be brand new, regardless of whatever industry it's in. Does the brand, do they inject a lot of capital as part of the deal to help you start it up? Or is that part of your investment as the new franchisee is you got to pay for maybe building the new building, outfitting the space, doing all of that? Is there any help from the corporate side on that? I'd say the help is less financial. That's kind of part of your it's investment. Part of the investment. And this is, yeah, this is your business. But the franchisor is there. If it requires a retail customer facing storefront, let's say they've got a real estate team that's helping with the site selection, that's doing the build out. They don't expect you to have any experience doing that. If it's a service based business that's not physical location based, yeah, you know, they've got all the demographic information in their systems to help define that territory and help you with the strategic marketing efforts of what do we do in week one? What do we do in the second month? You know, and then kind of progressing and they're marketing team oftentimes will do most of that for you. And actually where I've seen franchisees fall down oftentimes is they go in and they think they're the smartest guy in the room because maybe they had a marketing background and they say, oh, we should be doing it this way and that way. Oftentimes, if you follow the playbook, follow the system, it sounds cliche, but those are the best franchisees. I'm very curious about the revenue, obviously. All when I see that top line coming in. So as a franchisee, I know there's expectations for revenue and then the profit potential. But like you said, following that playbook, I guess, is that kind of your advice to them is this can very much bring in the revenue. We have projections for that. There's profit projections, but you have to follow that playbook. Is that the breaking point right there for this new franchisee? Yeah. So every franchise system has what's called an FDD, a franchise disclosure document. They update it every year and refile that with the Federal Trade Commission. In there, there's 23 sections. I mentioned the item seven, which is your all-in investment. There's also what's called an item 19, where they break out really their historical financial returns. It's not a given, but it gives you a really good starting point as you build out your pro forma and make your projections. You also get to talk to other owners before you buy the franchise. You can hear about their experience and what their ramp up was like. Yeah, but just like any business, you're going to ramp up in year one, you know, it starts getting going. And some of them do start really fast out of the gate. Some, it takes a little bit of a ramp up. I had a client texted me first thing Saturday morning this past week and said, Hey, look at this. They had a nice plaque that had their revenue from year one. It was over 1.2 million in year one. Wow. I'd say that's on the higher side. A lot of people may be closer to that five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar range. And margin wise, it just depends. I mean, probably somewhere in that 15, 20% range. A lot of our clients have been getting involved in a men's testosterone, kind of like a healthcare uh, business. I mean, those things are margining 30%. And it's not that that's a 30% return. That's 30% of revenue. And that revenue is a higher baseline than what you invested in. So you can really see some outsized returns and it opens people's eyes. We have one franchise system that a bunch of our clients have bought into and their franchisees are averaging 1.7 million. Some have been open a few years, some have been open one year, but averaging 1.7 dropping about 27% to the bottom line. So call that, you know, let's just call that 500,000 on, you know, to the bottom line. Well, they're all an investment on the business was around 200, 225. So you're netting a great profit year over year. And it's a yeah. business that you can sell down the road. Now that assumes that you're going to be involved in the business, right? You know, if you're paying a manager, then that's going to eat into the profit a little bit, but still there's enough meat on the bone to, <laughs> to make it work. Yeah, that's incredible. Talk about profitability. Nice to the tune of half a mil isn't so bad. What industries for these franchises do the best in your experience? Yeah, you know, part of it depends on where they are in the country. Part of it depends on their background. Some people love the idea of a recurring revenue business. Some people like the idea of a bigger transaction, bigger ticket size. And so, you know, there's a lot of different dynamics and dimensions that we look through in analyzing these opportunities. Some people prefer a B2B business. That's business to business. You know, there may be a longer sales lead time, but the payoff may be greater. But for me personally, I'm invested in several property services businesses and one health and wellness business. Property services, everything from for some reason, I like concrete. So I've got a driveway business. I've got uh, here in Atlanta where I am, I've got a paving business up in Minneapolis that also does line striping like for parking lots and parking decks and needs based business. I'm invested in a custom pull out shelving franchise that's been growing really fast. And that's more of a home services type opportunity. Last fall, I invested in a business down in South Florida that's 
custom orthotics. So, you know, they use 3D printing to create insoles for footwear for everyone from high school athletes to the seniors, you know, out there that have different uh, medical conditions. They also sell some footwear as well. I've got that set up down in Del Rey outside of Boca. And that's one of the, the very unique cases where the franchisor will actually run the business for you. You pay them a small management fee, but they staff it. They take care of the day-to-day. There are only a couple of companies that offer that, but it's obviously a pretty attractive model. And I've had a bunch of clients buying in. But you're a franchisee? You I You am. own that franchise? Yeah. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. Well, and that kind of leads into my next question is you had mentioned earlier that real estate, uh, so real estate investors in particular, are really getting in the door here. Why is that? Yeah, I think there's a few reasons. That there's definitely a similar mindset. You know, they're attracted to the tax advantage benefits of you know, whether it be accelerated depreciation or what have you. Oftentimes, they go along with business ownership. I mean, I personally pay my kids in the business. They ship out our books and do a few things for me. It allows them to now put money into their Roth IRA. So there's just different things that you could do that you can't do as just a W-2 employee, right? I'd say we're seeing more and more real estate investors, probably 75% of my clients also invest in real estate in some capacity. And the reasons are right now, I mean, there's scarcity of inventory in real estate. You know, there's just, just not many good deals to be had. Plus interest rates have gone up so much. I failed to mention, Brian, when I was talking about the funding side a few minutes ago, when I talked about people investing at 150000 to 300000 some people are using cash. Quite a few use an SBA loan. Those are very, very common. Banks like franchises because they're more predictable, right? So they're more willing to lend. And we've got some great funding partners that help our clients. But in that case, you're probably putting in 50000 in cash and then using an SBA loan. That's a common approach. Some are actually using an old retirement plan, a 401k or IRA, rolling that over through what's called a ROBS program. We set up the business as a C-Corp and you actually buy it with a retirement plan. So quite a few different options. But you know, what I would tell your listeners is if you're jiving with what I'm sharing here and you think this may be of interest, you know, from a net worth standpoint, franchisors do have you know, minimums there. They just want to make sure that you're in a position where you're comfortable buying a business. I'd say on the low end, you probably need at least 150,000, 200,000 net worth assets minus liabilities. If you're not at that mark, I'd say work up towards it. There are franchises that require a higher net worth, but I'd say that's kind of on the lower end. And we have plenty of opportunities at that point, but just wanted to mention that. Okay. Yeah. Cause I feel like it's easy for a lot of folks out there to feel like franchising would be unattainable, right? And for some of us, we're still building up bank accounts, right? You're in that growth phase and that's part of life. But knowing that franchising is a very lucrative business, first of all, and especially in the eyes of banks, that can definitely open doors to, like you said, SBA loan or banks in general being friendly towards franchising. I think that goes a long way for people getting into the business who possibly otherwise might not have felt that it was for them. Yeah, you're exactly right. That is the key is just not eliminating yourself right off the bat because there's always possibilities. Picking that right franchise, is it something where you're going into it knowing all that comes with it, right? And then being able to decide how to run that. I know you mentioned in one of yours that the franchisor kind of runs it, and that's a little bit of a a different scenario. But is it up to the franchisee to go in? You got to learn how to staff it. You got to find the right people. Is there a lot of hiccups that come from in that startup phase to getting it off the ground? Yeah, absolutely. You know, standing up a business takes work and there's going to be surprises and the guy that you thought was going to be a great fit ends up not being a great fit. I mean, all that stuff does happen. You kind of have to go in knowing to expect the unexpected, right? The nice thing of being in business for yourself, but not by yourself really helps a lot. So first off, you go into that purchase eyes wide open. You've got this FDD document that tells you everything about the business. Then you've got other franchisees that you've already spoken to to hear about their experience and ask them questions. You've got a ton of information. And then you go in you say, hey, let's do this. Well, the franchisor is going to have a checklist for you from day one of, hey, here are the things that we need to do to get this business launched. And then from launch, here's what it looks like. Here's what we recommend as the marketing plan. Here's all the things that we're going to be doing to support you. So again, it's following the playbook. That's what it comes down to. And those are the best franchise owners. When I was at Shelf Genie and I looked across our sea of owners, the best ones were the ones that were at least halfway good with people, right? There was someone that people wanted to work for. You know, they're not total jerks, but they're also willing to follow the playbook and just say, hey, there's a reason why I bought into the franchise. Let's go execute. And that's the beautiful thing is day one, you know what needs to be done. You're not guessing. You're not saying, hey, could there be a product market fit? 
it's already been proven out. Let's just go execute it. But it takes people to execute, right? Especially if you're putting someone else in charge and said, that's where you're giving your attention, finding the right person, setting up the incentive plan correctly. The franchisor can lean in and really help with that. So really, you've got a teammate going in. Do you have a lot of franchisees that own across different industries? Like they might have one or two in like five or six or seven different industries? I do. Okay. I do. Good example. I, I think of, he's a great example, actually. Nathan, my client in South Carolina, he's 41 years old, become a good friend of mine. We do a, a deal every year. He comes back and buys another franchise and promotes one of his young guys that he's met in his community that he really likes. In his case, he actually gives them some equity and says, hey, go make us proud. And I think every deal that we've done, he's come back and bought additional locations within the first year. But he's up to six franchise brands, 30 territories, does about $35 million a year. Largest franchisee of two men in a truck moving service. That's one of his. But he's an example of how you can pull it together into a portfolio. And for him, it is across industries, which I think you were asking about. Yeah, yeah. Across industry ownership. Yeah. yeah. I'd say he's steered a little bit more towards property services, which is where I've been playing as well with most of my investing. I've got one right now that's looking to buy a tiny home franchise. There's a housing shortage in the U.S., tiny homes. And they bought into that men's health one that I mentioned a few minutes ago already. Well, those are two very different businesses, different staffs, but there are some synergies too to owning both. Let's say there's a, a local business. Maybe they're doing $5, $10 million in revenue. They're doing really well, but they aren't franchised. Are there opportunities where a franchisee or a franchisor goes to these businesses and they, I guess they either buy them out or ask them if they want to franchise that actual business? Is that a thing? Yeah, absolutely. No, I've got a partner that takes companies soup to nuts through the franchise process and it gets them all set up to be able to go offer new locations to others. A lot of benefits. I mentioned private equity loves franchising, so it does set you up for a good exit, allows you to expand using other people's money who have skin in the game, right? They know their local markets, they've invested, you get synergies of the bulk buying, all those things I mentioned earlier. The flip side or just awareness side is you have to go in and really be ready to staff up to support these new owners, right? You've got to set clear expectations of here's what we're going to do for you. Here's what we're not going to do for you. Otherwise, you could wake up and have kids all across the country that have expectations of you that, you, you know, you just need to make sure you start out on the right foot and how you go about it. And that's where bringing in franchise expertise like a partner of mine or someone else in the industry really helps. Because from my seat, when I evaluate franchises on behalf of our clients, I'm looking not only for industry experience, which these people you know would likely have, but I'm also looking for franchise experience. So that if they've never been on the franchising side, I want to see that they brought in a leadership team member or more that have supported successful franchisees because I think it can be two different animals and you really need both. Right. Coming from the small business owner side myself, I'd be very curious to know what the process is of, let's say I owned a concrete business and we're doing really well. We're based in Cincinnati, but there's a lot of opportunity in Dayton. There's a lot of opportunity in Louisville. You can create locations wherever you want. Just go open another business in that area. But is that officially franchising it? Or is that where you're recommending it would be best to have someone on your side from the franchise world who can kind of help you conglomerate that, if that's even a word? But <laughs> does that make sense? It depends on your aspirations. If you're looking to stay regional and local and you can adequately support these new owners, and I think some of it comes down to the industry too. But if you go open Columbus and Cleveland and Dayton, that's different than going in opening Philadelphia and Dallas and Los Angeles. You can at least start off that way if you ever do want to go national, then I think you need that franchise experience. But still, I think having a partner on the sideline that's at least on your board of directors or something to help you understand the ropes of how do you support them, how do you set those expectations, you know, what kind of things should a franchisor be providing to their franchisees. But no, you could definitely start small and if you've got a couple of buddies in these different locations and they want to chip in. Really, the definition of a franchise is a shared brand. It's a corporate entity providing support to those owners and those owners sharing some portion of the revenue or some payment back to the franchisor. So you do have some companies that are operating as franchises today that don't even realize it technically, but yeah. it's always smart to, to get it set up legally the right way. Right. How does a franchisee know when's the right time to, maybe they own one, how do they know when the right time is to go get a second or to investigate another city for a third? Again, looking at the comparables, looking at other franchisees in the system, where, when did they make that jump? The challenge is if you don't buy the rights to it up front, you may not get prime territory, right? Our biggest challenge right now is that good opportunities move super fast in areas. So if you're running a good business, you want to go expand, that territory may or may not be available. You may 
end up having to buy another franchisee if they're willing to sell. That's why a lot of our clients will have some buy as many as seven locations or 10 locations at times. They're not spending all the marketing and spending all the capital outlay, but they're just buying the rights to those locations so that they can eventually open them up and give themselves that path to scale. Okay. Kind of like reserving the location for future use. Exactly. Huh. All right. Makes sense. So you had mentioned that the ones you're involved in, they're definitely not local to you. It doesn't sound like you have to be local or hyper local to start your franchise empire, if you will. What's the truth to that? Or is there a huge benefit to being local? Or is it maybe once you're more experienced, it's okay to branch out? How does that work? I'd say there's a huge benefit to being local. Just to be honest, two out of my four are here in Atlanta, two are away. One of them is the franchisor managed. So if you have a model where the franchisor is going to run the business, no, you don't have to be local, right? Because you're not involved in the business. My one in Minneapolis is fairly absentee as well. I'd say for most people, especially their first time out of the gate, you don't have to be local, but it just makes things easier. It just gives you one less hurdle to kind of jump over. If it's in your backyard and you know the market and you've already got some friends and family to kind of get the word out and support the business, you know, in the early organic growth days, that just helps to be able to check in on the business. But I had a client recently, he's in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and he wanted to buy a dumpster business. Well, it wasn't the best market for it up there just from a population standpoint. So he bought it down in Texas. I think it was in Houston, but he hired a manager to run it down there. So if you know, have a brother-in-law or someone you trust in another location, yeah, you could buy the franchise and have them run it. You just have to have that game plan going in because if you're going to be involved in much of the day-to-day, then just do it locally. So like just using Cincinnati where I am as an example, comparing like an Orange Theory franchise to more like a service business, say like a, a pest control franchise, In terms of regions, I guess those are probably broken down within the city, right? Because you can have Orange Theories in every neighborhood if you wanted, but you can't really have tons of the pest control franchise in the region, right? Yeah. A city like Cincinnati would probably have like four or five territories, if you will. And so you could have other owners in that same area. Maybe in the case of Orange Theory, they draw a radius around, you know, your location, say you're protected from others opening up within a three mile radius or six mile radius. Okay. With the pest control, it could be, we define a territory by 250,000 in population. And again, they've got the demographic information at the zip code level to help define that territory for you. If you just buy one territory, there's a chance someone may come in and buy the other territories. Now, you guys are neighbors all of a sudden. Now, that could be a really good thing from a brand awareness standpoint, right? Because you always have people moving around. So if you see the trucks driving by and the yard signs or what have you, there could be a halo effect that raises all ships. Obviously, you want to get along with your neighbors, and but it could provide you with a good exit opportunity as well, selling to them or potentially acquiring them. Okay, very cool. Well, John, I want to make sure I respect your time here. What is one piece of advice you'd like to leave with the MU listeners here as it comes to non-food franchising? Yeah, from a more general standpoint, I'd say I love the line activity breeds activity. I, I think when you get off the couch and you start moving in a direction, that's when opportunities find you. I like the Encourage people not to just be wannabe preneurs, but step up, be an entrepreneur, get in the game, at least do your research. But from a more tangible standpoint, you know, would love to offer our book, Non-Food Franchising. It's an easy read, about 95 pages. Our clients, ever since we released it a year ago, we've gotten a lot of valuable feedback and would love to share a free digital copy, either audio or PDF with all of your listeners. If they come out to our website, franbridgeconsulting.com, just share your name and email address and we'll reach out to you. And you know, we'll also ask you if you would like to take a next step and book a call. I'd be happy to jump on a call and help them as well. I love that. And that little piece of advice, don't be a entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur. Just get in the game, get started, start educating yourself. Never hurts to start learning about something you might have a little bit of interest in. The sky could be the limit, right? That's right. All right. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us today. This was some wonderful information on non-food franchising. You kind of opened up a whole new world in my mind, so I hope we had the same effect with our listeners and followers today. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks for having me, Brian. Alrighty, there you have it, folks. Round of applause for John Austinson of Frambridge Consulting. I don't know about you, but he really opened my eyes to the possibilities in non-food franchising opportunities. It really seems like the sky is the limit in that industry, and it's really worth digging into. I know I'm going to check out his stuff just to see what it is, because I'm one of those entrepreneurs where I just kind of have to know a little bit about everything. So I hope you all found this interesting and valuable. We can't wait to continue to share our information with you. If you want to get more of it, feel free to hit us up on your favorite social media platform. 
We are there and sharing our content with you on a regular basis, and we can't wait to interact with you on social media, or feel free to reach out to us at support at millionaireuniversity.com. We want to hear your feedback on the show, or maybe there's some topics that you want to hear more about. We're happy to chat with you and see what you have in mind. So with that being said, that rounds us out for this episode of the Millionaire University Podcast. We'll catch you on the next one.